I'm Yaron, I'm a CTO for Iguazio. I, beyond my day-to-day uh, -day job, I also uh, like to write uh, code. I, I like to work with uh, other people on standardization and I, I blog a lot. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you what I think is sort of going to happen in that, in that space and, and looking for, first for some perspective. So first thing, uh, what is DevOps? Anyone, you know, before we talk about MLOps, so what is really DevOps? So let's, let's think about the definition of, of uh, DevOps. It's essentially uh, doing all those things, but the, the key summary is in uh, close alignment with the business objective. So the, the role of DevOps is doing all that uh, work around automation and all that to deliver agility to the business so we can be sort of more aligned between development and uh, the business uh, goals. Uh, but essentially MLOps is exactly the same, so there's no uh, big difference. And if we look into DevOps, what, what is really DevOps? This is sort of the, the usual uh, life cycle in DevOps. Uh, where you, you define some plans and you, you create some, some stuff and then you test and verify and, you know, and, and release and package and, and all that. And uh, if we try and apply it to data science, so data science is just sort of they create maybe some planning, sort of uh, research, maybe some verification at a, a small scale. And there's 80% uh, of other stuff that uh, needs to be done by someone are ML engineers, ML ops, data engineers, whatever. Uh, so this is a, a very uh, critical to understand. We need to, to address the 80%, not just the, the 20%. So, and if we, we take this sort of work of uh, data scientists for based on what we've, uh, we've talked to users and, and customers, they will tell us usually that about 20% or 10 to 20% is data science. Uh, a lot of work is, is invested in sort of feature engineering, data preparation, data exploration, and significant amount of work is in MLOps or DevOps. And what uh, people are really looking into is how to address those big, big bars. And there are two ways of addressing those big, big bars. Uh, one is what we, we think, and some of it we've announced, but we don't think it's confined to a Iguazi offering, is machine learning functions as a service. And what is a machine learning function as a service? It's not necessarily something that I provide you as a service, but also uh, Amazon or, or Google coming with a service saying, you know, throw up some pictures and we'll provide you a, a model that tells you this is uh, going to predict those faces or whatever. So. I think what we're going to see more and more is people packaging those functions that do certain things repetitively, or even people will, will sell you those functions uh, in a way that you don't have to work too, too hard. Uh, the other things that we see popping up, and I think we had a presentation uh, from uh, Twitter uh, today about feature stores. Everyone is also talking about other solutions in the market, like Uber did their own Michelangelo, and there are other some projects popping up in the industry around how do we uh, simplify the notion of feature stores? So people, when they do what's a feature store, is essentially you do data engineering, you get some uh, normalized data set, and this is what's being used for training. We speak to a lot of a large uh, organization which build their own. We're trying to learn from them how we can sort of uh, try and, and do something like that for our customers. Uh, but this is a, essentially a trend that we see coming. There's also a project under Kubeflow called Feast, it's very early stages and again, very confined to a Google environment using BigQuery and things like that. The other thing that uh, from our perspective is people are looking for sort of more standardization and, and openness. We had this uh, discussion right now about the evolution of standard in the space, but people will need to have interchangeability. People will need to be able to move between clouds, between cloud and on-prem, between different frameworks. So I think uh, my personal agenda is to try and, and bring uh, sort of more standardization and, and openness to that uh, space. So <clears throat> essentially, what's the benefit? Uh, let's start talking about functions. What's the benefit of introducing this notion to, of functions into our pipeline? What is our pipeline? It's in just you know, preparation, training, and, and serving. <clears throat> if we can start plugging functions, where there's the ones that Orit uh, demonstrated today with, with Nucleo ML functions, or whether it's a cloud service that's going to provide you something, or, or an app store with services, that means that you could just start plugging those functions and build pipelines much faster. And then what you need to do is essentially see it's interleaving functions and feature stores, or functions and, 
and data uh, engines to build those, those pipelines. And then eventually what we'll see more and more in the, in the market serve, serve just like a, an app market where you'll have vendors that sell you some, some uh, tools that do some specific algorithm or process some data. It's not really confined to algorithms. We always think about algorithms, but taking data from Kafka from a certain JSON schema and doing some analysis and aggregating could also be a function. It doesn't have to be something doing machine learning. So we spoke about this workflow that essentially you have code. In order to productize this code, you have all this huge process. You take this code, you package it in a container. You finish that, you, you think about scaling it out. Scaling out is very different across every framework. Sometimes you do it through load balancing, sometimes through reduce or, or sharding or data partitioning. And then you need to tune it. You know, if it's querying, you need to do caching, you need to do you know, optimization of your queries, into this GPUs to the mix. And then you, you think about operation, operations. You need to add logging, you know, artifact logging, tracking, uh, monitoring, security, traceability, all that stuff. And eventually you're trying to build pipelines in CI, CD, so adding more and more layers. So this is really why some projects, the data scientists come and throw something within two weeks, but it takes six months or more to automate that, that process. So, we need more and more automation, but what's sort of missing to get this uh, nirvana, at least from my perspective, you know, as, as, they, as David just said, is we're missing a contract. Okay, we're missing this line the, where the, the work of one guy ends and the other guy continues. What's the contract between the data scientists and the DevOps or the data engineers? And this is really where we're trying to sort of essentially come with the, with the a certain uh, concept of doing that. I think, again, MLflow did some of that and other people are doing that, but uh, I think we have to come with, sort of, we have to have an agenda, and you saw essentially what uh, the people in the panel said is they're looking for the customer to push them on moving into that direction. But I think from the customer perspective, this is what you guys want. You want to have the choice, the flexibility, so you need to push on those uh, uh, vendors and, and, uh, and members on this is really what, what we need. And, and when I'm looking into what's really needed for a contract, then we need a way to define how we provide inputs to a job, like parameters, security credentials, uh, data sets, et cetera. We need a way to record everything that was done there, you know, like logs of uh, artifacts, models, you know, operational stuff like logs, monitoring, telemetry data, uh, results from our experiments. Then we, we need a way to integrate with automation tools, with the CI, CD, with machine learning pipelines, okay? So that's something also, again, some of my personal agenda, I'm also maintaining this uh, uh, GitHub, to trying to, and uh, writing some specs around it. Anyone that's interested in collaborating on that effort is sort of uh, welcome. So we talked about uh, function, which is one of the things that I see emerging more and more. Uh, the second thing is feature stores. Because today, feature management is very challenging, okay? We have data lakes, uh, we have things that are served in between, uh, we have things uh, we pass data between uh, stages of a pipeline, uh, things for real-time serving, and uh, it forms a few challenges. One is, uh, how do data scientists sort of collaborate? So, uh, you know, for example, or in my team, data scientist, so when he builds a notebook, half of the notebook is data engineering. Half of the notebook is uh, machine learning, uh, you know, logic, and 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 then essentially the same data preparation stuff that he did in order to build the features could essentially be used by another data scientist. So, uh, how can we collaborate? And this is if you look at the big companies like Uber, uh, we're talking to a company like Wix and others. They all develop their own feature store in order to enable more collaboration between a data scientist. The second thing is that you form features in, in training, it's very easy, you know, you just take a bunch of uh, Parquet files or CSV files and, and do some ETL and you run some training. And then you go to production, you don't have the same features or they're not up to date. So how do you manage that? So if you look at all those new technologies around feature store, they're keeping synchronization, you know, for example, using Redis or key value for uh, storing features for real time and using other technologies for storing features offline. We also have a solution for Iguazi on that space. But again, we want to create more and more standardization in that area. 
And uh, the last thing is how to automate the generation of those features. Because sometimes someone wants a feature, it's not really a materialized feature, it's not stored anywhere. You need to go run a Spark job, run uh, some pandas code or whatever in order to form this feature and inserts that into either a real-time online feature store or an offline feature store. So this is again a trend that I, I think will, will happen and materialize more and more in the, in the near term. So the general idea will be that you'll have sort of a feature store. The feature store will probably have tiering architecture within that. We use the same notion of function as a way to, you know, you're hitting a, a certain feature, you request some features, and then there are functions that form those features into the different tiers of data. So this is essentially what we've started seeing with all those open source projects that are coming in that space and also the solutions that we are, we're working on. And, and the last slide sort of is uh, if we think about uh, MLOps platforms and we had this discussion here, let's try and think about what happened in the past. So I'll have one example of what we see. And, and Clemens actually was touching this point. This is the world yesterday. A lot of container orchestration systems, you know, some, some of you may identify with the logos, Mesosphere, Swarm, ECS, et cetera. And if you look today, I think sort of the last one to convert was Mesosphere coming with this sort of D2 IQ. There's no longer any sort of specific container orchestration platform because it doesn't make sense that something so fundamental in the enterprise ecosystem will be owned by one company. So I think what you'll see more and more is that essentially those things starting to converge uh, and <coughs> And, and again, I don't know who the winner is. I have my own guesses. I think you know, a project that has more collaboration for multiple companies probably will stand more chance. Uh, but this is, I think, what we're gonna see in the industry. So with that, thank you, and uh, hope you enjoyed the, the event and you learned something. And uh, again, you can talk to any of our team uh, while we're here, so thanks.